There was a feature like documentary called Between Friends and Family, and that is a film about um, in 2009, I agreed to be a known sperm donor for a lesbian couple in Durham, and so I happened to be in film school at the time also, and decided to make a personal documentary about it. And so over the course of um, sort of making the film and kind of exploring this unconventional relationship that I have with these women and now their children, um, I did a lot of research and sort of thinking about like you know, issues of representation and not just how I represent my own story, but also their story. And um, you know, just kind of being growing more committed to being really thoughtful about that, and which is sort of how I encountered Carrie. Mm -hmm. I think through sort of talking about those issues of representation. Um, and at the time, I was in a master's program um, in women's and gender studies, and I was studying a lot about uh, queer theory and about feminist critiques of documentaries. So it was actually really helpful to become a little more involved in the actual construction of something that I was so accustomed to um, critiquing. So. I helped Rick sort of in the final stages of that film. Um, and then from that, um, so we wrapped up the film and then we're talking a little bit more about how we wanted to continue doing work that involved queerness and representation, but we wanted to do it in uh, using slightly, a slightly different model. It takes a really long time to put together a feature length documentary and it also takes a lot of resources. So we thought that doing something shorter form and doing something web-based would be really nice because it would allow us to highlight lots of different stories. Um, it would allow us to do it in a pretty sustainable way and it would allow us to share those stories with people um, really quickly after we had worked with them. And just to sort of speak on this idea of activism, I think for me, finishing that film and then showing it to people, it was really, I think, sort of unexpected in a way, like the, you know, just the reactions of people who sort of saw maybe their families represented in the film, or people who saw representations of different kinds of families that they had not encountered before. And so that um, it was a really rewarding experience for me of just being able to see that and kind of talk to people, and everybody has sort of a different connection with it. Um, but it was like a long, you know, like four years of time to do it. Um, so it was sort of about, you know, thinking of how could, how could we kind of duplicate that experience, but in a way that wasn't so overwhelming. Um, and so we kind of wanted to do something a little more sustainable and a little more acceptable or accessible to people. Um, so we kind of chose YouTube as this distri distribution format so that it could just be out there and available to people and also be kind of a shorter turnaround time for us so that we could keep our sanity and uh, not be buried under the work. Um, so a little bit about KIQ. So um, it's a series of short films. They're all under 10 minutes. Uh, we released our first one in January of 2013, so just about a year ago, and we've released eight uh, to date. Um, an example of some episodes, our most recent one is highlighting the internet as a positive resource for queer identified teens. Um, I worked with a former student who lived in a rural area of North Carolina on that episode. Um, we've also done sort of more like uh, episodes that profile really amazing activist work that people are doing in LGBT circles, um, like uh, Chords, uh, Queer Oriented Rap and Rock High School. We went to their first summer at camp um, last year. Um, we got to highlight the amazing work of April Parker and the Reading Out Loud campaign, um, and did a short project with her. Um, we've done academic episodes about the concept of performativity um, and profile the queer folk musicians and things like that. Um, we're currently working on an episode about creative responses to street harassment for queer identified folks. Um, so that should be coming out in a month or so. Um, so a little bit about the concept of why, why the name, Keeping It Queer. Um, we felt that it was really important for us to be highlighting stories and narratives and experiences that are about the idea of queerness not just as a way to identify but as a way to be in the world and also as a way to sort of highlight how it is that people keep it queer so watching brother outsider i was thinking you know how if i had the opportunity to make a kiq episode with with fired rustin i think he kept a lot of things queer um and it would have been so great to to be able to highlight that in a, in a more specific way um well, I, I actually running out of time, but I, but I would suggest that maybe I might do some future episode with stars doing this. Like, oh, you know, I was right. I was on that. Yeah. So definitely, actually, we should um, do that. Unfortunately, the museum folks are definitely going to take us out. Oh. I just wanted to do I know maybe we're going to give a specific thing to get involved in it yes. too. And so I just wanted to move to that. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I appreciate this panel because.
because what I'm looking at is how change happens, hearts and minds, whether it's film, dance, poetry, and also the concept of uh, public policy. And I'm thinking that. But also, I have to say, for me to be sitting in this room on this day, with this film in this place, takes care of that little issue you just talked about. And the fact that we're now on our third uh, third annual uh, Bayard Weston Symposium, thanks to Guilford College, and then partnering with the International Civil Rights Center and Museum, it's good. But also, just real quick, um, there's a generational thing that's happening here in a major way. All of us who are post-World War II baby boomers are now in our 60s that were in 60, you know, like whatever those years were, 79 million of us. How many people in this room are between the ages of 18 and 25? 80 million of you have ever been this time to have a conversation intergenerationally about what we're going to do, but not only the issues. We were just at the Moral March down in Raleigh, right down the street here. And if you want to know what that looked like, I looked at the image of that march 50 years ago. That's what it looked like today. We were, you saw it homes. And what I'm struck by, and maybe it's the uniqueness of the South, but also, the interesting thing about the shifting, other shifting demographic, by, by 2050, this country will be majority people of color, California already is. Keeping in mind, who was already here indigenous to these lands before anyone pulled up to these shores? And if we keep that in mind, understanding about how we're coming right around the bend again, and how we have to think about not only being intersectional in terms of our, you know, our issues, but just the issues of race and class and gender and women being told that not you a long time ago around like the right to vote, the right to you know serve in the Congress, the right to be in the military and or marriage and poly. I'm just struck about 50 years later where we are sitting right now. And I'll, and, I'll, and, and I'll tell you a couple of exciting things that I would like to invite everyone to be a part of. This year is the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer. People were giving their lives because of what happened down to have the right to vote. There's a huge, big push for people to be involved in Freedom Summer, 64 Voting Rights Act. But next year is the 60th anniversary. Remember when they said fire came down there in Montgomery, Alabama? This is the 60th anniversary of that. So the National Black Justice Coalition, Southerners on the Ground, anyone who wants to be involved in celebrating this in 2015, we have an open invitation. But also next year is the 50th anniversary of the, of the Selma to Montgomery March. So we get to figure out how we collectively, whether it's through film or poetry or whatever, find a way to be collectively involved, whether we're going to Alabama or do that work here. And I'll end with this. Please understand the importance of civic engagement. People gave their lives for the right to vote. The Supreme Court gave us wonderful about the Defense of Marriage Act. Thank you, Edie Wins. 